It's a pleasure to be here and share my, a bit of my story at the, be at the beginning and also my research. And I hope that we can have some questions. At the, um, feel free to ask any questions, interrupting any, any time. And or at the end also we can do that. So, okay, having said that, I will talk about epidemic forecasting. I have been working extensively in epidemic forecasting before COVID and also during COVID, a lot of that. Uh, I will show you multiple things, uh, how, uh, what we learned, you know, multiple technical challenges and also how we can get new AI solutions from this domain. Before that, I was recommended by the uh, organizers to put some, some things about my, myself. So I am a new assistant professor. Uh, I just joined the uh, University of Michigan. And my research focus, as you can see there, is special temporal machine learning, AI for science, multi-agent systems, scientific quantification. And application domains are in public health, which is going to be today's focus, and community resilience as well. So I am uh, looking forward to also hire new students. So if you're interested in my research, please reach out to me. Uh, I want to say that I, I am from Peru. I, I, everything I started over there. Uh, this is, that, is, that is me in the left, in the red one, and the, also me. So I was kind of a part of a research, a student research group. Over there, we don't have any faculty advisors usually. Over there, we have what we had is like a students that are motivated, and they wanted to do some kind of research projects in quotation marks, and we are trying to do something, coming up something new. So that is me present making presentations in Peru. After being in Peru and doing these research projects, I had the opportunity to uh, to jo to go uh, to do an exchanges program at the University of Oklahoma, thanks to a scholarship that I got. And after that, after that, I got, I was able to do a master in data science in the, at that university. After that, I applied to two PhD programs. I remember that I attended to one of similar workshop to this, which was called Broadening Participation in Data Mining. That was at the conference KDD. So I have attended to one of these uh, workshops, and I was able to connect with one faculty member that was later my, my advisor. And after doing this process, application process, I went to first Virginia Tech. My advisor moved to Georgia Tech and I finished my PhD at Georgia Tech. And now, after my PhD, I am now a faculty member at the University of Michigan. So I want to share uh, from my experience, I want to share also some, a few things that work out for me uh, in, in regarding to the considering new opportunities. I always try to aim high, uh, and I, I, I thought that it was possible to do a PhD, to become a professor, so I tried very hard to do that. And Things sometimes work out, you know, so, so it worked out for me. I am very happy for that. But I was also seeking acti actively for opportunities. For example, the workshop that I mentioned to you, I was always in the seek of this kind of events that could give me the opportunities to connect or to do something uh, outside of my comfort zone. And also, uh, I was, you know, I would recommend to do your research sometimes uh, we have resources at our hand in the internet. There are multiple resources available that we can leverage. And after using those resources, we can now go and talk to other researchers for ask, uh, seek for advice to complement this knowledge that we gain from our own research. Uh, that is for, for being considered to new opportunities. Now, once you are considered for an opportunity, you have to grab it, right? You have to secure it. So. Something that I will, I will, it worked for me is to basically trust your training. Once you are in the interview, once you are, for example, here on front, you have to trust your training and then see, you know, I, I believe in myself, I believe in my skills, and I believe that all the, the five years I was, you know, doing research is going to pay off. And after you're given the opportunity, you have to take ownership of, the, of your own career, of the projects that, for example, your advisor or the, the company they give you take ownership. You make you you are the most the only responsible. Take, consider that you are the most responsible person for making that succeed. And also, of course, we be kind and polite with others. 
So those are my, my few thoughts that I wanted to share with you on regarding to my career. Now I, want, I will move on to research site. And I will motivate the research site by you know, just acknowledging the impact of epidemics in our society. This is, these are some numbers for the US. So in the US, this is for last winter. For COVID-19, we had around 200,000 new hospitalizations during the last winter. And 20,000 people, more than 20,000 people died because of COVID. For influenza, we had around 85,000 new hospitalizations. And you may be thinking that this is maybe the, 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 all the, the period of the winter, but actually it was only a bit of more than uh, 30 days, one month. It's a very huge toll for our society. We can think of this problem as a spatial temporal machine learning problem, where in each of these dots, which represent, you know, basically this is a, a map, and each of these dots is going to represent a, a quantity of number of cases, number of hospitalizations, and we can see this over time. For example, we can see have this time series, and we can understand the, situ the current epidemic situation and also have an outlook to the future. So the outlook to the future is going to be what we call forecasting, and that is my focus today. We, in this domain, we have multiple heterogeneous and multimodal data. This is called a surveillance pyramid for public health. At the very bottom, we have all the population. Um, some, some people are, for example, going to get infected. Some people are going to be symptomatic, seeking care, all the way until some people are going to die because of the disease. And each of these levels, we are going to have a, agencies or a companies collecting data sets. In the, one, in the, the ones in the left are mostly public health related ones. For example, the CDC is one of them. And in the ones in the right are the digital sources of data. For example, Google provides us data about symptomatic searches, or uh, Twitter about uh, posts in social media related to illnesses. So these are data sets that are available and there, and we can take advantage of them. And they have been proven to be very useful for, epi for, for forecasting epidemics. So the vision of my work is a, uh, in big picture is take advantage of, of these data sets and connect them to decision making through predictions, through predictive modeling. Um, specifically, my approach is deep sequential models as scientific machine learning methods. So in order to realize this challenge, this vision, I identified three, three challenges that I want to be presented today. Uh, first is leveraging heterogeneous multimodal data. In this domain, data is scarce. Uh, you may be familiar with Cypher 10 that we have in computer vision. They have thousands of images, but for influenza, or for COVID-19, we have much less information. Also, we have that multiple data sources may disagree. So for example, before the vaccine, it was clear that higher mobility will lead to higher number of cases. However, after the vaccine, and also we, uh, after the vaccine, this was not a direct proportional, direct, proportional direct anymore. It was more nuanced. A second challenge is uh, an issues arising from real-time settings. We do this epidemic forecasting on a real-time basis, and we submit predictions to the CDC on a weekly basis. So we have to deal with data quality issues that are not carefully present in, in, in some environments. And give, let me give an example with revisions, data revisions. This is uh, the data released by the CDC as January 1st, the green one. And a, a model, a reasonable model, will make these uh, blue predictions, right? The predictions in, on January 1st. However, it turns out that after two weeks, the CDC will release this other data set and will tell us, no, not, actually now the, date, the data should be up, should be going up. And you can see that after two more weeks, the yellow one, and after two more weeks, the, or, the uh, orange one. So we can see that it was now the data that the, the real data that what had happened is very different from what we had at the very beginning. And a model can be misled by this if we, we don't take into account this uh, phenomena, these data revisions. What we did in my work is to analyze these data revisions. For example, we can analyze for one single week how this was revised. The dynamics, we can convert it to what we call a revision sequence, where we, in the x-axis we have the revision week and the y-axis we have the value of this signal. And we did this for Oh, sorry, I um, want to say also that they, we can measure here 
revision error, you can see that uh, the relative error of the initial versus the final, and also how many weeks it takes to stabilize. We analyzed this for around 30,000 revision sequences. And what we found is well, it, was a, it was a very significant problem. Half of, half of these signals have a more than 30% of revision error. And on average, it took four weeks to stabilize. And we also saw that the revision parts were uh, diverse. So it was non trivial to make uh, these, these, uh, these corrections in, uh, immediately. So we had to learn something more complex, more nuanced here. This is a second challenge. And the third challenge that I want to share with you today is how to bridge data and epidemiological knowledge. In epidemiology, we have models that are, have been used but developed by epidemiologists that are based on causal mechanisms that they believe that they are important that are happening in the population. And we can also leverage this connected to AI and make it to, to answer some qualitative questions like what if counterfactuals. And if we got, were to open this book, EPI 101 book, we will see what is called uh, mechanistic epidemiological models, which broadly speaking, we can think of two of them. One is ordinary differential equations, which are the popular SIR model. And this SIR model, essentially these equations are going to be governing how many people move from one compartment to the other, and each compartment represents like a health status. Some people are going to be uh, healthy, are going to be susceptible, others are going to be infectious, uh, I, and the R is going to be the recovered. So if we have some data, we have uh, also some initial con assumptions about initial conditions, we can solve the differential equations and we can get something like this. In addition to that, we have what is called agent-based models, which are essentially a simulation of a, a, a people or agents being interacting in a computational world. And they are, there are, will, there will be a spread of the disease across multiple contact networks. You can see here we have the workplace network, we have the household layer, and also the school uh, network. So in each of these, there, there will be some spread of the disease, and we can simulate this for multiple days and calibrate these models as well. So these are models that have been used in epidemiology, and we want to connect them to AI advances. So that is also that is the, uh, what we refer to in this challenge. So now I'm going to be presenting briefly the methods that we have developed in order to address these challenges. I want to say that uh, we have been deploying and developing these methods considering the intricacies of COVID-19. As I mentioned before, we did this before, the, before COVID with influenza forecasting, and then working closely with the CDC in 2020, in the first quarter of 2020, what we did is to help the CDC with COVID influenza forecasting. Then we moved to influenza for, sorry, to COVID forecasting itself, also helping to the CDC. Then we were selected in, uh, with, for media coverage as well, and also participated in some contests. And after that, we obtained some awards for this, for, for this work. And I want to share today the, what we did for, specifically for COVID forecasting. Very briefly, we, what we did is having an operational framework for, for COVID-19. This is very early in the pandemic. We had to deal with multiple things like noise, revisions, and also there, are, there were some misalignments in the data. So we had to deal with this, and we, we were doing that in this part, in the data module part. In the prediction module, we had our neural networks, once the data was clean, we were using our neural networks to make probabilistic predictions about the pandemic. And in the third module, we are talking about explainability in order to provide some certain explanations to the to decision makers on why we are making certain predictions. And also we can assess also if we are doing uh, well, uh, relatively, relatively well in the previous, in the last, uh, in the last weeks. Now, let me talk, talk about the modeling part, neural epidemic forecasting, we call it. So I told you about two challenges. One was leveraging heterogeneous multimodal data. And in this challenge, what we have to do is to take advantage of what we know about the, the epidemics. We know the epidemics, they spread especially. So what we put here is some special propagation constraints in order to help the learning process. We also consider that there are some multimodal data sets. One, for example, can be uh, demographics, other one can be time series, other one can be graphs, other one can be text. 
So for each of these, we can uh, have an encode, different encoding, but in addition to a different encoding, we also encode differently the uncertainty quantification. So you may, if you're familiar with uncertainty quantification, each of these are going to have different noise, noise levels. So we have to have a separate encoding for each of them. And then we do a data a fusion of all of them in order to make the predictions too. And also we consider some uh, characteristics of these forecasts that are hierarchical. Uh, we may predict for a state level and also we may predict for a national level. So this has to be some, uh, some co cohesion uh, between these pr uh, predictions. So that is also what we pro uh, put in hierarchical forecasting problem. A second challenge that I mentioned is the issues arising from real-time settings. As I said, we had to handle missing values in the data, delays in reporting, and in addition to that, we handled what we, uh, that I presented to you, the data revisions part. In, in order to do that, just give me, uh, uh, let me explain you a little bit of what we did. So you remember that we had these data, data no, these revision sequences. So what we can do is to group them based on they are, where they are coming from and also what type of signal they are. So we can see cases, California, for example, sur survey data from uh, North Carolina, and, each, and we can construct a graph based on similarity between this group of signals. The similarity is going to be based on the, uh, on the distance metric TTW. And based on this graph, now we want to leverage this graph in order to make our representations of the re data revisions. So in, in number two, what we are doing is essentially doing a, a graph convolutional network with, a recurren with recurrences as well in order to capture the dynamics and also the similarity given by the graph. In number three, what we are doing is putting everything together, all the representations in addition with the representations of the historical bias of the model. And then now we can correct any single model that we have there, maybe let's say your favorite model, based on these data revisions representations. So what we are doing here is figuring out if we can improve the top models in the CDC for a casting hub. One of them is our model. And we were able to improve all of these models for, by, by a, a significant amount of performance. So this is just one example of what we have been doing in epidemic forecasting. And in, as I mentioned before, doing this on real time in order to support the response for COVID-19 for, for CDC. So our impact by doing this was that we were part of the CDC official ensemble for COVID-19 and also for influenza. The CDC director uh, tweeted about these predictions in addition to other predictions from, uh, from other teams. And thanks to this visibility, this was being used by decision makers at multiple levels. And also our model was among the best performing models in the CDC forecasting hub. It was in the top five, and it was, this was an evaluation led by the CDC for more than one year of submissions. So this is the, real, the, the kind of the, the application part, the deployed part of my, my work. And as you can see, there were multiple papers that they arise from here, but they are always focused on the application. And one more point that I want to uh, bring to the, today is the how to bridge data, AI, and epidemiological knowledge, as I mentioned before. So we have here two works that, uh, in which we are doing this. And I will, will explain to you also why we, we, we want to do this in the first place, right? The first one is that we can do some transfer knowledge from a mechanistic epidemiological model, for example, a SIR model uh, based on differential equations, to the neural network. That is the first thing that we, we explored. And the second one is how we can connect neural networks to help the calibration of an agent-based model. So why do we want to do these two ideas? The, in the first, the first idea, we want to do it because neural networks lack of understanding of the mechanisms of long-term dynamics for the epidemics. So these SIR models, these compartmental models developed by epidemiologists, they have been specifically created with, the, with these mechanisms that can help us to guide neural network into this uh, very challenging uh, task. So that is why we want to transfer this, we want to make this transfer of knowledge. That is idea one. In the idea two, what we are doing is trying to help the mechanistic model, an uh, agent-based model in this case, and incorporate some data sources that are going to be helpful for calibration, and also make it to be much faster. If you have, I'm not sure if any of you have worked with agent-based models, but essentially we have 
We're talking about millions of people being simulated for two, three months of or more, right? Of a, or of a period of time. So then what we have is a very expensive simulation because we have to model every single interaction on there and how it's been transmitted and so on. So it's very expensive and also it's very challenging to calibrate because of the expensiveness in in the in running this and also because we don't have we, we, we don't have gradient-based optimization methods. We have gradient-free optimization methods, which we cannot use what we have learned, for example, in deep learning. Uh, so my work is trying to bridge this gap and connect a uh, gradient-based optimization with AGN-based models. So I want to be presenting briefly these two ideas. Um, in addition, before going to that, I want to say that our, my work is a bit different from other others in the sense of that we are working on their end-to-end learning with mechanistic epidemiological models. In traditionally, we have that we have data, parameters, a mechanistic model, and then epidemic forecast. So basically, we have a disjoint optimization here. So what we are proposing in my work is to do this connected from data to epidemic forecast directly. And we are going to have some interplay here of neural and mechanistic components in an end-to-end -end differentiable pipeline. So why do we care about this? Because we can now put neural networks and use it, all the tricks that we have learned from other domains into this, uh, into this domain. So we can do now transfer learning, we can do self-supervision and so on into with epidemiological models. And we can also take advantage of gradient-based optimization. As I mentioned before, gradient-based optimization is one very e efficient way, effective way to, to do this, efficient and effective way to do this, uh, to do challenging optimizations of, with multiple parameters. And we can also take advantage of software and hardware that has been developed in the AI community to uh, help these purposes. We can take advantage of, of PyTorch, we can take advantage of, of GPUs. So we can do, now bring these ideas into public health. Having said that, I will present briefly these two ideas. F the first one is incorporate dynamics uh, of a, from a differential equation into a neural network. And what we are proposing is taking advantage of the, the literature in physics in four neural networks. In physics in four neural networks, we usually have that given certain inputs, then we are uh, predicting certain, the outputs of a neural, of, uh, of the variables of the, are going to be represented as an ODE. In this case, SEIRM is an extension of, of, S, of the SIR model. And we are going to be training it end to end here by just doing this minimization of the loss. And we are computing this. Let me just point it here. We are computing this uh, derivative ds by dt via autograd. So that is one of the key ideas here in physics and formula networks. However, if we want to use these physics and formula networks to for forecasting, it's going to be very little informative of the future. It just with if our neural network only takes time. And also, if the neural network only is working with multi-layer perceptron architecture. So what we propose in this, in this work is to have these uh, data features that we saw before, and then put it into a neural network that is going to be more appropriate in inductive bias to, uh, for time series data, which is a deep sequential model. It can be a transformer. It can be a, a GRU, an RNN. And then we are going to be making this optimization possible. But in order to do that, we have to do some innovations here into the, into the intricacies of the model. So if you are interested in learning more about this, please uh, take a look at the paper. And the second idea that I want to share with you is the mechanistic uh, calibration with neural networks. In this case, what we have is an agent-based model, as I mentioned before. These agent-based models are going to be interacting in this computational world. There are going to be a million agents. Uh, but what we have now is a reformulation of these traditional agent-based models into a differentiable simulator. So now all the, these operations are going to be fully differentiable, and they are going to be also specified by domain experts. So we have a transmission function that is going to be specified by domain experts, a progression fu function, a, a disease progression uh, function also specified by domain experts, and all of these are differentiable. And what we are doing is connecting them with neural networks now. Now that they are fully differentiable simulator, we can connect it with neural networks, and we can do gradient-based optimization as we usually do. 
And what we, we are doing in number one is, is incorporating data sources from uh, heterogeneous uh, sources and also multi, the multi, multiple modalities into neural network, we, which we, we call the calib and then neural network, calibration neural network. And we are pre predicting some parameters of uh, the, this agent-based model that are going to be governing the disease spread, the simulation. In number two, we are uh, running this for multiple iterations. And in number three, we are aggregating the results. We are uh, comparing against the ground truth data from CDC. And we can now compute a loss function because everything is, is fully differentiable. We can do map propagation to the neural network parameters. So this is a kind of a way now to calibrate in a more, in a faster and also more efficient way uh, these uh, agent-based models. And, we can, and, and if you are not aware of these differentiable simulators, there are other, other differentiable simulators also for physics, for chemistry. And there are multiple opportunities that, we can, that, that these simulators can open up. For example, in, if we don't know the transmission function, what we can do is to put a learnable function there that we can, can help us to discover this transmission function. So th this is something that, uh, that we are very excited about. And uh, these are the second idea that I wanted to share with you. Some conclusions of a future work are that I, am, I think that there are multiple opportunities in other communicable diseases. For example, you may have heard of uh, these vector-borne diseases, which are uh, given by mosquitoes or sexually transmitted diseases, football, uh, football disease, football, sorry, football uh, disease illnesses, and there are also some sensors, uh, applications that we can leverage, data that we can leverage in order to have an impact and make a, a have an informed response to uh, to these diseases. In addition to that, there are also AI and CS problems that can be motivated from this domain. I showed you already some of them, but uh, we can also think about uncertainty quantification here. In this domain, it's very important to have a appropriate uncertainty quantification of your predictions. So I didn't discuss much about it, but we have a few a few papers on this in this topic as well. We also care about explainability. We care about privacy when we are using people's devices. HCI on how, visualize, how to visualize these predictions, how to understand data, how we can help domain experts, decision makers to make decisions. And we can also think about NLP, NLP problems, text mining problems, and how to mine this social media data and capture these uh, dynamics of the disease or, re or relevant patterns for dynamics of the disease. We can also think about causal inference or how we can complement causal inference methods with mechanistic models. How we can uh, also in social computational social science, how we can model cultural background that is going to be relevant for understanding how a population is going to react to certain epidemic or pandemic. And HPC problems because we are dealing with large scale simulations, so we also have encounters on HPC problems. As a conclusion, I want to say that uh, I hope that you I convince you that. There are, multiple, there, there are multiple ways we can make AI to be useful to public health. There are also interesting solutions and technical problems that we can get from here. And it's exciting and impactful avenues for collaboration. So these are my collaborators. And these are also, this is also my website. And if you have any questions, I, I will be glad to take them. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, I have a simple question. What have you used to implement the agent-based model? What, sorry? What framework have you used to implement the agent-based ah, okay. model? Is yeah. it something you implemented from scratch or you used, an, ex used a, you know, yeah. an existing framework? Yeah, thanks for the question. It was PyTorch. All right, so you implemented all the agents in PyTorch. That, yes. That is my question. Yes, 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 okay. exactly. So what we do is, essentially, we, uh, I, I was talking of million size populations. So we have a tensor of one million size, and we are doing operations on top of this tensor. So that is what we are doing in order to, sim to do the simulation. And the graph that comes out of that, is uh, something you, you check and uh, you analyze in, in PyTorch, or you don't, you don't rely on graphs like in classical agent-based modeling? Uh, the, the graph, you mean, what, what graph? Yeah, the mean? graph of interactions between uh, ah, okay, okay. Uh, yes. your agents uh, within the model. So the graph is, uh, we, so what we did is, get data, mobility data from SafeGraph, and then we constructed some contact graphs. Then based on these contact graphs, we, tr we put them in network X, and then we run basically what we have, uh, a message passing operation over these tensors, 
and the, and the graph. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I got a question for you that's more about the practicality. One of your slides talked about uh, how your method improved the mean absolute error. I think the range, um, if you don't mind going back to it, I think the range went somewhere between 2 and 8% percent improvement in MAE. Was that an absolute improvement or was that a 2% improvement from whatever was the previous model's baseline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, a, an absolute improvement over predictions across multiple months of this of the model. Okay. And in terms of impact on public health, I guess, how do we interpret a 5% change in mean absolute error? And, or is it not interpretable until you go down to like the region level? Mm. Yeah. No, that's a really good uh, question. We have in, 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 in this task, the CDC has some baselines. That's a baseline that is a kind of historical baseline. So that is kind of the minimum that you will have, you will have to beat and in order to make it more useful, to be useful for decision making. Now, the, our metrics, as you noted, they are kind of a performance metrics that they are actually not capturing fully the decision making process. So we only have this baseline, and as long as we are better than this baseline, we we are think we are we, we know that we are contributing to this this project, but we don't have a way to how to measure how much better the decision can be or not. So that is a that is something that the community as a whole, not only computer science but epidemiologists, public health experts, they are working on coming up with certain way on how to measure this. Was there a, a region in the data that was particularly difficult for the model? Just by yes, yes, that, that's a, that's a great question. Yes, that's correct. Uh, there are some data, data, uh, regions where the data is kind of uh, spiky because, for example, there are there are very few people maybe living there, and there are also many a few people going to the hospitals. So you will see that the the the, the epidemic curve is going to be spiky, noisy. It will it will not make much sense sometimes. So the patterns are going to be harder to get. And then these models are going to be failing there, for example. So there, there are there are more there is more to do. There is more to do in order to investigate uh, how we can learn something better in these these domains where the statistical sample is lower. Yeah. So I would say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah.